Hello, everybody. I am so happy that you chose to join us once again. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come to say thank you. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for being our, our God, our Father. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are on article number 12, The Harmony of the Law and the Gospel. And our author writes, We believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin. To deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. And so we're going to jump uh, back in with our verses from the seventh chapter of Romans. And I hope that uh, you have found the time to read and possibly even reread the entire chapter. Again, this week we will read all verses from the NIV unless uh, stated otherwise. So we're going to read verses 7, 12, 14, and verse 22. Verse 7 reads, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. So then, the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. That was verse 12. And then verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. And finally, verse 22, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. So thus far we have said that the purpose of the law is to point out my shortcomings so that I will see how messed up I am and my and I will also see my need for a savior. Paul says that the law is good because without it I would not have known sin. I can hear somebody thinking, hey that could be a good thing, right? If I don't know a thing is sin, then I won't be held accountable for doing it, right? Well, why don't we call on King Josiah to answer that question? Uh, he, in the 22nd chapter of 2 Kings, uh, while repairing the temple for worship, the book of the law was found. Can you imagine the book of the law or the Bible for that time period being lost in the temple? It's like being lost in the church. And not just for a little while, but for years. And they found it, not because they were looking for it. They kind of just stumbled across it while doing some work in the temple. And, and then when the secretary told the king about it, it was as if it was an afterthought. You know, he, he kind of said what he really came to the king to say, and then he's like, oh, yeah, by the way, Hilkiah, the priest, found this book and gave it to me. Then he read portions of it to Josiah. Now, here's the part. When Josiah heard the words of the book, he immediately knew that he and the people were in trouble with the Lord. Even though they didn't know what it said, he knew that they were in trouble with the Lord. He tore his robe and sent the priests and others to find a prophet. And in this case, they found they went to a prophetess to see what the Lord had to say. And so 2 Kings, the 22nd chapter, verse 13 says, Go and inquire of the Lord for me. This is Josiah talking to the uh, priest, uh, the secretary. Go and inquire of the Lord for me. 
and for the people and for all Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. My point is this, that not knowing is not an acceptable excuse for not doing what the Lord says. We are either under the law or under grace. And when you think about it, even in our man-made laws, I didn't know is not a get out of jail free card. Then Paul in Romans, the first chapter, verse 20, he lets us know that we are without excuse. He says that Paul, God has revealed himself not only in history, but also in the beauty and order of his created world. He, he's saying we should be able to just look at the world, look at the, the earth that the Lord has, that God has created and know that there's a God. So Paul says he has, God has removed any excuse for ignorance of himself. And so even though sin distorts the truth, it does not remove the possibility of perceiving God in nature because God has, has just, nature itself screams to us that there is a God. So then we're back to the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Last time we discussed what makes the law spiritual. First, because it was given to man by the Spirit of God. That makes it spiritual. Then next, it is an expression of the will and nature of God. And then finally, the law is spiritual because of its purposes. So the problem is not with the law. The problem is with me. Paul has like a confession. Uh, he confesses in verse 14. He, he says that he is unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. The King James Version says uses the word carnal for the word unspiritual. It means to be made of flesh, to have a body of flesh and blood. It means the flesh that we were born with, that was given to us by our parents. Carnal also means to be given up to the flesh, to live a fleshly, uh, sensual life, to, to, to be given over to animal appetites. It, means to be controlled by one sinful nature. Paul said that he is sold under sin. That means that as a creature of flesh, he is a slave to sin. He is under sin's influence. He, it, it means that he's capable of sinning and he's guilty of sinning. It also means that he cannot keep from sinning not perfectly you know you can not do some things but you can't miss all the ways there is to sin and, and it also means that he cannot erase sin's presence not completely and he cannot cast sin out of his flesh not totally even though we cannot do some things we're not totally uh rid of sin and he cannot rid himself he cannot rid sin get rid of sin permanently not and and then he cannot free himself from being short of god's glory jesus said in john the eighth chapter verse 34 he says that everyone who sins is a slave to sin so even though paul is speaking in the first person he is speaking of the predicament that we all are in he very well could have used the pronoun we instead of i then as if paul is saying let me explain to you what i mean by being sold as a slave starting in verse 15 he says 
I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I, myself, who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, and that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I want, for what I do is not the good I want to do. The evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Now, the very first time I read those verses, and they came alive for me, I was like blown away. It was as though Paul had somehow invaded my space and, and, and that he knew my struggles. I couldn't even imagine Paul, the one who wrote most of the New Testament, would have the same struggles as me. I thought I was the only one that had those issues. That alone convinced me <clears throat> that the word of God was speaking to me. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Y'all, that's the struggle. That, that's our struggle. That's everybody's struggle. Every Christian struggle. How many times have I told myself that I am not going to do a particular thing? And that is the very thing that I end up doing. How many times have I told myself that I'm, I'm going to, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut no matter what is said. And then before I know it, I've said exactly what I didn't want to say. How many times? And the list can go on and on and on. We all have the struggle. And it's real. If, if, if you are a child of God, you have the struggle. My life before Christ didn't have those struggles. I said it and I did it without remorse. And at, the, at times even applauded myself for doing it. But now that I am a child of God, I don't want to do it. And yet that is what I do. Yeah, I gotta quit talking about me and go back to talking about Paul. You, you know, it's 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 always easier to talk about somebody else's issues than to put your issues out there. So back to Paul. Paul says, I don't understand myself at all. Now, you know, I got to really agree with Paul. He says, I'm doing the thing that I really don't want to do. And the things that I really want to do. I don't do. Paul says he won't he wanted to do right. He wanted to please God as he went throughout his day. He he wanted to to at the end of the day end the day by saying, "Oh, I please God today." He wanted to conform to the image of Christ and become all that God wanted him to be. But despite his desire and expectations of himself, before he knew it, he found himself doing exactly what was not pleasing to God and coming short of his glory. No matter how much he hated and struggled against coming short, he always found himself short. Second Peter, the second chapter, verse 19 says that a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. And Paul says that if I'm doing what I don't want to do, then I agree that the law is good. It is the law that tells me that I come short. The law tells me that despite all of my efforts to please God, I never reach the mark. I always fall short. I may know what is the right thing to do, and I may try and do it. But knowing and trying 
will not save me. Think about what Paul is saying. He says, and this is me paraphrasing, if I'm doing what I don't want to do, then it makes sense to say that something is causing me to act in a way that is against my will. And that something is sin living in me. Now, I should point out that sin has always lived in me, but it has not always bothered me because before becoming a Christian, I was in agreement with sin. We didn't have any issues. Sin said do and I did, and we were both happy. The problem came because sin wasn't a good master. It wasn't a good running buddy. Its purpose was to destroy me. And after a while, it wasn't fun anymore. Sin was leading me over a cliff, doomed to die. That is when the Spirit of God caught me and showed me that he was a much better master, a much better husband than sin. So I gladly died to the law and was free to take on a new master or a new husband. The problem is that sin is like an old boyfriend. It just won't go away. He has decided to coexist with my new relationship, always trying to trip me up. He knows that he can't get me back, but he hangs around just to murky up the water. Paul says, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not good, is not the good that I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. That's the old boyfriend. Even though he has been kicked to the curb, he won't stay down. He keeps whispering in my ear, and, and, and because I'm weak, he causes me to do what I hate to do. Then it is as if Paul paused and carefully considered his predicament and, in, and, 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 and said in verse 20, Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. That makes sense to me. And it explains my frustration. I have a sinful, deprived, and corrupt nature. The old man, the flesh, and he lives in me. I carry it wherever I go, 24-7. I don't want to sin. My will is not to sin, but I keep on sinning. I, I want to please God but I consistently fail to conform to the image of Christ. Why? Because I don't exercise willpower. Not, well, not because I don't exercise willpower. And it's not because of a lack of focus or knowledge. I fail because of sin that dwells in me. It's within my flesh. It's with me all the time. It tugs and pull and pulls me to sin. And no matter what I do, no matter how hard I try and not sin, I end up sinning. I cannot control sin and I cannot keep from sinning. For that reason, my flesh is void of any good thing and the law points that out and we'll end this week as we did last week in the words of that great theologian marvin gay it makes me want to holler and throw up both my hands this ain't living oh no this ain't living well loved ones join us again next time as we continue on our journey until then Take care and be safe. Bye-bye.